something at Georgia Tech. Uh, she was also the founding director of the Persons and Randomness Center. So uh, he has made many breakthrough contributions to the theory of algorithms, including uh, high dimensional <laughs> algorithms, sampling, learning, optimization, uh, context geometry, and randomized linear algebra. Of late, he's also been interested in uh, trying to understand the computational capabilities of the brain. He's also written two books based on his research, um, and he's designed and taught many new courses based on his work. So much so that uh, the spectral algorithms course that we have in our department this semester is actually heavily inspired by Santosh's course at Georgia Tech. Okay. So he is without doubt one of the leading researchers of this generation. Um, and he has kindly agreed to tell us about his latest work on the complexity of the neural network. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am uh, very nervous about the talk and this topic in particular. So let me start by saying that I'm a theoretician. Um, probably you will learn, you, you won't be amazed or astounded by, uh, this will be the first neural network talk where you won't be completely blown away. <laughs> in fact, you'll be, um, as I am, uh, uh, feeling, oh, is that all we can say? <laughs> is that all we really know for sure? Yeah, but that's, so, set the bar. Thanks for the invitation. Um, Anand was a PhD student at Georgia Tech, uh, uh, and uh, it was great to have him there. And uh, uh, I think it's terrific that you're building this strong group in, in, in all aspects of computer science and theory in particular. Okay, so uh, this, what I'll talk about today has two parts to it, um, an upper bound and a lower bound, as we say in, in theory. Uh, some uh, a limitation of what we could possibly be true and something that we can prove is true. And uh, please ask lots of questions uh, at any point. I, uh, I'm, one of the struggles in this research has been figuring out what the right precise question is. Uh, okay, so but, but to set the stage, um, uh, certainly there's no doubt that these successes are, you can't but take notice of them. Uh, they can beat you at games, they can beat you at classifying uh, classification tasks, uh, at driving, at whatever, all of these things, right? We, we hear about this all the time, and uh, um, hard to argue with, the, with, with what's being presented. Yes, you can find some bugs, you can find some flaws, you can give it some data that fools the network, but just the fact that roughly the same algorithm is running on huge data sets and able to do all these things, it's incredible. Right? I mean, this, is, this, this would not have been conceivable 10, 15 years ago. So, yes. Yes. What was the last one? <laughs> There's a question mark. Right? <laughs> right, yeah. But I don't know. There is nothing that we do that, in principle, cannot be done by a machine. And uh, <laughs> you only care about writing this. <laughs> yeah, just the network is coming. <laughs> Not from me, but yeah. Okay. So the answer is, of course, just deep learning. And so uh, here is a very quick review, just so that you know how little I know, but, so, uh, but, but here is how we can see it. We're given labeled samples, x, f of x. We think of x as being some set of attributes, let's say real value. And the function f is a, is a function being computed, also real value, but it could be classification labels, like integers or whatever. But, and that's your data. x is drawn from some distribution, typically unknown, but it is drawn from a distribution. And what you'd like to compute is a function g. So you're, you're finding g. g is in your hands. Given an x, you can compute g. So that the, these functions are closed. And specifically, let's say they're closed in least squares error. So uh, if you evaluate over the same distribution from which examples are drawn, the difference in the function squared uh, averaged over all points is at most some epsilon. Epsilon is in your hands, so it might take longer time or more samples as you reduce epsilon. But that's the, that's the goal. Okay, um, and so the typical solution with the networks is that there's a, there are some parallel layers which are computing nonlinear functions of the previous layer. I'm just going to talk about feed forward, the simplest versions, feed forward networks with single real output, okay? So, which, which are already doing amazing things. Um, um, they're computing uh, an affine uh, function of the input x, w and b are weights that are fixed, weights and biases, 
and then the next layer could, could be doing this again and again, and fi a final output layer I'm thinking of as just a Nafine combination. So summation, weighted sum plus some constant. That's your output. So this, this is the type of neural network. <laughs> and now what activation functions do you use? Um, 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 one of the most commonly used ones is a sigmoid, so it's wanting to be a threshold, but it's a smoother version, which is nice for many reasons, including the fact that you can compute a gradient quickly. But you might also want to use others, like a like a rectified linear unit, and so on. So, so that's the nonlinear part. But typically, it's the same one, or maybe two different ones alternating. Okay. And the question then is: so this is this is what you'd like g g the function g that you compute will be of this form. Okay. How do you compute it? Uh, how do you, in other words, how do you define the weights and the biases and the uh, the perhaps the the reason why it's so uh, ubiquitous is that there's basically one algorithm, gradient descent, which is, look, you care about minimizing this loss, which is the sum of squared errors. And so let's just look at the gradient in the weights that you get to define of that loss and update every time. So you have a loss function, which is just the sum of squares errors. You, you get to change your weights. Which way should you change? Well, locally, you should change in the direction which reduces the loss. That's exactly the gradient. So update by the gradient. How much of an update to apply? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a parameter you have to choose. You don't want to apply too much. Maybe the gradient changes itself. So maybe a small amount. OK. So when I say one algorithm, it's really one method, one uh, class of algorithms. You want to apply a gradient. How you compute the gradient and how what weight of what um, scale of the gradient to apply, these are all decisions to be made, but nevertheless, the, the algorithm has this flavor. Okay, so the weights are updated like this. And that's it, repeat this. Um, and, and if you have many layers, it doesn't really matter, you can still compute the gradient. Uh, in the early days, they used to do it layer by layer, and that's still an efficient way to implement things, but it doesn't really matter. You can compute the whole gradient in one shot, still recover basically the same results and so on. Um, so the goal, <laughs> As a, um, you know, I understand this theory is that you know this is working really well in practice in all kinds of data scenarios. What can we prove about it? What, what's proved the truth? Um, okay. And a special case is when the data itself is generated by a neural network. Okay, so generally you've got some function you want to learn, approximate, so you uh, train it with a neural network and you try to say that it works well. But maybe if you assume that the data itself is generated by a neural network, maybe that makes life easier because at least you know there exists one that perfectly matches. So you have the hope of near zero error or zero error. Does that help? Actually, that's not much of an assumption. Uh, there are multiple uh, classical results that tell you that any continuous function can be approximated by a neural network. So this assumption that data is generated by a neural network is actually essentially universal. It's, it's vacuous. It's true for any function up to arbitrarily small error, any continuous function. Um, in fact, you don't even need many layers. One hidden layer is enough to approximate any real valued function. So this is, this is the reason why, at least as a method of representation, neural networks are universal. With just one layer, of course, you might need many units, depending on how complicated the function is, but it's only one hidden layer, and then an output sum gate is already enough to capture, approximate, any continuous real valid function. Okay. So the game really is, can we learn it? Given that you, the representation power is, 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 is there, can we learn it? And uh, maybe there it helps that data is generated by a small neural network. Because at least you know that not only is there a representation in the class you're looking for, there is one whose size is not too much. Because it's still a game of finding the right one, yeah? Okay. So, Starting question is what form could such a such a guarantee take? Like, you know, what would such a theorem look like? It's, it's, you know, um, and uh, in particular, under what conditions on the distribution over examples and the function that's being you know the, the function that's given to you um, will gradient descent? And I use the word stochastic here. We'll describe it in a minute. Under what conditions could this possibly work? Um, yes, it works for playing Go and for classifying images and 
and for driving cars, what is the characterization of these, of these input distributions and functions? And does it help if, as I mentioned, if the, if, the, if the data is actually generated by a neural network, as one might call realizable, of some bounded size even. Okay, so neural bounds for this have been around for a while in complexity and algorithms. So um, my uh, advisor, Alvin Blum, with his advisor around the West, proved that training just a network, if data is coming from just three nodes, a neural network with literally three units, each of them is a threshold function, is already NP-hard. So if you assume nothing about the input distribution and you know that the function is coming from three units, it's already NP-hard to learn. Okay. Exactly. Sorry? Exactly. Uh, yes, it's NP-hard to, yeah, so this is a zero one function to, uh, yeah, yeah. And learning it with, so uh, with uh, a few more units is also NP-hard, even though it's really coming from three. You can also ask uh, if you think of this as a least squared loss rather than uh, learning it beyond a certain uh, threshold for error is also empty hard. So yeah, it doesn't have to be exact, but the original statement was, was yeah. Okay, so what does that mean? Maybe there exists some distribution and for which this is hard to learn. Uh, presumably P is not equal to MP and so there's no efficient algorithm. Clearly it's not getting in the way of practice. So where, are, where, where should we make more assumptions? Now let's continue, there are more lower bounds, some of them more recent, which under stronger assumptions, so that was just P not equal to NP, under stronger assumptions, you know, certain problems in cryptography are, are secure. Um, you cannot efficiently learn small depth networks. So if you assume that the data has been generated from depth two, depth three even, uh, there are stronger assumptions which tell you that you can't learn, learn these even improperly, meaning the original one has some size k and you're allowed to use any polynomial in k size, still it's hard. Okay. Uh, okay, so so far we made these, these, these assumptions, there's no distribution involved. It's just, uh, it's about the structure of the problem, there's no distribution. In principle, the distribution which is making it hard, or the class of distributions, is some worst case, perverse, unnatural distribution. That's it. But then there are, there are results, and one of them is one I'll spend the first half of the talk on, is that even with nice input distributions, uh, some deeper learning algorithms, and this was a paper by Shamir in 2016, don't work. Okay, some, some of the co common ones. So this is saying, suddenly, even if you assume the distribution, input distribution is nice, in this case it was a Gaussian distribution, uh, and uh, the particular algorithm was standard gradient descent applied to the least squares function, you show that it doesn't work. For what? For what input, uh, for what uh, a target function I haven't specified, yes. Yeah, okay, but we'll get there. So here's the layout of the talk. The first part, I'll uh, talk about lower bounds, so we know what we cannot prove for sure. Uh, in one line summary of that is that you cannot efficiently learn functions computed by small same the hidden layer neural networks even over nice input distributions. Okay, it's in quotes because there are several things that I have to make precise before it's appearing, but that's what we'll get to. Okay, so then, you know, this is certainly still not satisfactory. So there's something more that needs to be said because things are working in practice for whatever people tried on. So the second part is that gradient descent can learn, can train single layer networks with if they are non-degenerate enough, and by that we have to make certain assumptions on both the types of, um, in particular the units have to be unbiased, we'll see why that's important, so, or constant bias. If you, if you allow the bias, you know, when you're taking a, an activation, you're, you're saying, you're applying something like a sigmoid or some non-linear function to an inner product, plus a bias potentially, okay? And this is saying, at least for unbiased networks, you can train them, and exactly to what error and how efficiently we'll see. We'll see. And, and the, along the way, you'll have, we'll see questions, but also at the end, I'll summarize some of the questions that I am I, I, able to make precise. So, to go to the load bound, here's what we will, in fact, we will describe a family of functions, which will be generated by a network. It will be generated by this network, okay? this type of network. 
and uh, we we'll show that you can't learn it. You can't hope to learn it by in efficiently. Okay. The inputs you could imagine are just Gaussian inch coordinate of Gaussian, for example. That could be one setting you keep in mind. And uh, these units, let's say they are sigmoids, so very standard sigmoids, and the output is a sum of those. Okay, that's the type of thing, or make it more precise. In case you're not familiar with sigmoid, you know, it looks like that. There is a parameter S which controls how sharp the this sharpness, how sharp this, this goes. As you increase S, it becomes more sharp. So you might imagine that as you increase S, things should become harder to learn, maybe, because it's, it's more and more like a discrete function. But nevertheless, this is the unit being used at each. Uh, this is the activation function being used at each unit. Okay, but more generally, you could input any log concave distribution of your choice. So for example, rather than uh, Gaussian, it could be uniform on the interval 0, 1, or minus 1, 1, H1, okay? Um, and then here for the units, you choose. You can use any of those com commonly used ones in practice, and then it's a linear output, okay? So the lower bound I'll describe in a minute will apply to any such. You get to pick the log concave distribution, input distribution. You get to pick the activation unit. And yet, it will be hard for the for, for any algorithm of a certain class, you'll see in a second, uh, for, for training this neural network to learn. Yes? So, are these distribution independent or the correlation? Each, 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 yes, it's a product distribution. So, each input is, a, is independently being generated. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? So, you care about the input distribution because you want to quantify your error as, as a vector? Um, Many of, the, many of the complexity results rely on the distributions being uh, chosen carefully. Uh, where, for example, they're, in particular, they're discrete, they're the Boolean hypercube, and they correspond to certain hard sets. So, which you could argue is unnatural for real life. This is just trying to say that even if you assume what appear to be benign distributions, independent coordinates, continuous, in, you know, in this very nice sense, still, it's, it's hard for you. You know, if, if, if distribution is discrete, maybe an example doesn't tell, a single example doesn't tell you much about its neighborhood. Things change very fast. It's not Lipschitz or anything like that. These distributions are smooth in the smoothest way you could imagine, and still it's hard. So, okay, so this is how input is going to be generated. All I, have to, I haven't told you are the weights, this, these weights here. Output is just a single summation. So these are just weights one. This, I haven't told you this, right? That's, that's the part you have to learn. I mean, there should be something you have to learn, so that's the part you have to learn. And, uh, and now you can, you, to, to, to learn it, you can use whatever network you want. Use your latest, most sophisticated network with multiple uh, layers and uh, whatever uh, uh, activation units and so on. Use penalty, you don't have to use least squares loss, use whatever loss function you want, so on, right? This is what people do in practice. This is an art still figuring out how to best learn a data set. And what we'll show, and it's still in quotes, and I'll make it precise in a minute, is that if, if all you're using is some, at each step to update your weights, you're using sort of a black box function of the input, gradient. Give me the gradient of this function on the data, or give me the Hessian, or give me this other perturbed version. Then, uh, for a certain class of uh, inputs, you're going to need exponentially many queries, which means exponentially many updates, gradient updates, for example. That's, that's the implication. Uh, as long as each gradient is not super precise, okay. So I'll, I'll get to I'll get to this. As long as every gradient, either every gradient has to be very precise, which means you need, you're going to need a large number of examples per gradient, or you need an exponential number of updates. So uh, just to point out that. You can learn this, that these, these class of algorithms, by, by these classes of input distributions, by more sophisticated algorithms. In particular, you can learn it by what's, uh, what we call, call tensor decomposition algorithms, where you formulate this huge tensor using a lot of data in one shot, and then you can decompose the tensor and learn it for this particular class. What we're showing is that neural network training is not going to do it. Um, okay, I mentioned that already. So, so the lower bound will apply to understand what the law we apply to any algorithm of this form. So you have a set of weights W, those are the current weights. You estimate some function V, which uh, uh, is uh, an expectation 
of, uh, of a function. So, for example, h could be gradient. Okay, you're estimating some function of the input like a gradient, and then you use this estimate to update your weights. You get to choose what you want to estimate. It doesn't have to be gradient. It could be some gradient of some loss, something that based on what answers you got so far even. Okay, but that's the style. So, the style point is that every real level training algorithm that we talk about fits this form. It looks like this. You might choose how how many examples you take this over, how exactly to update the weights. You know what uh, what uh, scaling of the gradient you should add to the current weights, and so on. But this is the form. Compute some function of the current weights using the examples. Use that to update your weights. Okay. So and now let me describe the functions itself. So first, using two sigmoids. You can formulate, you can, by just adding them, you get this bump function, right? This, this function that goes like that. Sigma and sigma, if I just add them up, I get this. You can think of S as 1 if you like, and then in this case is standard sigma with S e to the x, or 1 plus e to the x. And then what we'll do, the function will simply be the sum of these sigmoids with different biases, right? Each of these is one of those activation units. And, uh, uh, they all have different biases here, right? my integer multiples, and we add them up. That will be the class of functions. Okay. Um, so this, since we're just adding up these little bumps, it's roughly a periodic function in a large range. Not exactly because it decays out eventually, but okay. Uh, you can do the same thing with values. If you had a single rectified linear unit. You can, by adding a bias, combine two of them to get this, and then combine uh, two of those to get this uh, more, uh, 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 this piecewise linear bump, and then add them up to get this. Okay? So that's the, that, this is what the functions look like. The only thing I haven't told you are the weights that make up the input to the next layer. Okay. So here's the description of the weights. So this is a complete family of functions. There'll be two to the n functions. And then, um, uh, what are the functions here? So I'll tell you these weights. And the weights are very simple. Out of the n inputs, there will be a subset of s, s of them, of size n over 2. So there's n over 2 and n over 2. And those n over 2 will have weight 1 to all units, and the others will have weight 0 to all units. So these weights are just picking out the subset of size n over 2. Okay, it's just 0, 1 weights. And so there are two to the, roughly two to the n possible functions. One over square root n times two to the n possible functions. And uh, you see, so, so each sigmoid is computing a function of just this sum. Oh, and if you remember from the previous slide, we're adding a bias to it. The bias is different for each unit. That's the class of functions. When you first look at this, and I tell you it's of this form, the weights are one, zero, and they're all, all we're doing is picking the subset. This is how your data is coming. The network is small. You imagine, of course, you can learn it. Just apply, you know, some kind of gradient descent. Why, why should this be hard? And that's indeed what my colleagues, uh, uh, Li Song and Bo Zhi thought and believed, and they wouldn't believe that this could be hard. So they ran experiments. They have state of the art. Um, Li Song uh, worked at Google uh, uh, in the year when they ran into, when, when they were really heavily invested in, in neural networks. And uh, here's what they got. Um, this is the, the, I'm plotting the error. Uh, and, and this is even just a training error, not just the, you know, the, there's error that you get to when you're training, and then there's test error, which is you take a fresh sample and see how good was it. Even training error. So there is a point at which, okay, as, as if you look at s times square root n, this, uh, that's, the, that's the size of the batch. You know, that's the accuracy we're using. The training error after this point on it, so if you take s equals one, then this just think of this as square root n. There's a point at which, so here your error is pretty small, but there's a point at which the error reaches a constant value, 0 0.035 in this case, and just stays there. Okay? It doesn't, they cannot get lower error. They're unable to get lower error. And, and to, to learn, they tried everything. They tried multiple layers, changing the learning rate, different types of units, different initializations, all these things. Okay, all the state-of-the-art tricks. Okay. 
In fact, it's a more, um, it's just a, a, a more uh, dramatic than that. Uh, different input distributions, these are three different input distributions. That's the turn, test error and the turning, uh, uh, I, 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 I should label that as training error, training and test error. And the point here is that, no sorry, these are both test errors, but it's with, uh, those are with fit points and these are with uh, values, okay? We used to generate the network. To train, you try, I'm reporting the best error after many millions of different, different combinations of parameters, the standard thing doing deep learning. And in all cases, you will see that the error that we're getting after a certain size, you know, not very large network size, size 100, is at 0 0.035. And the reason is that 0 0.035 is the error you can get if you answer with just a constant function. If your output was just a constant function, right? for every input, you give the same answer. Okay? Your error is this much. I mean, it's just half of the expectation distance square. But yeah, it's a sigmoid. If you apply a constant function to a sigmoid, you, you know, sum of sigmoids will get a certain error. That's the error. Square error. That's the error. So basically, you're not able to go significantly below the error of a constant function for this class using all the state of the art tricks. That was the observation. Okay, so, um, so the answer is no, we're not able to. This is not working. So, so at least we should be able to prove why it doesn't work. Yes, they added they added the uh, realizing terms also in the objective function while training. Yes, yes. Um, the, no, I don't know one. Yeah, I don't know one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so this was gradient descent. And so I mentioned already that all we are doing is computing gradients, which are functions of the input distribution. So we don't actually have to look at labeled examples, right? We just need a function, expectation of some function over these examples. This will be the key to having a chance of proving a lower bound. And this is our, what's called a statistical query model, introduced by Kearns. 93, before we had neural networks in mind. Um, and the idea is that the algorithm uh, doesn't look at examples. All it can do is provide a function, and then there's an output that will evaluate the expectation of the function and give it back to you to within some error tolerance. Okay? So you're allowed to give a query function, you choose the query function, and it gives you back an error, it gives you back an estimate of the expectation to within some guaranteed tolerance. And you get to pick your next function based on all the answers so far, whatever you want, but this is it. You never see an explicit example. So we could, our queries in this case would just be the gradient each time. So these are actually quite general. Um, in, just about every machine learning algorithm uh, that's provable can be rephrased as a statistical query algorithm. Okay. Um, and I mentioned the only known example in a second. I can't, I've only known uh, exception in a second. But just to be more precise, what we're saying is that uh, we would like to compute the expectation of some function. Let's say the expectation is P. And you give it, I'm calling this oracle V stat or variance stat. You give it a parameter T, which roughly corresponds to how many samples, the batch size you want to use. And it has to give you back an answer so that the error is at most one over T and square root of p times 1 minus p over t, which is just like the standard deviation of t random units. Thank you. <laughs> okay, t random units, okay? The standard deviation of t random units uh, uh, is, is that, right? If I, if, I, if I, t random trials. If I were to pick t random examples, each of them has probably, you know, uh, expectation p, just, just think of it as binary trials, that would be the standard deviation. And so it has to report an answer within that standard deviation. That's the oracle we're using. And so this framework uh, allows you to prove lots of uh, uh, this uh, 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 lower bounds. And the exception I mentioned is uh, learning parities. It's a problem we know how to solve, but the only way we know how to solve it is Gaussian elimination. 
So if your function was just uh, a function over a billion inputs, and it's one, if the number of ones is odd and zero otherwise, this function we can learn by just writing down linear equations mod two and solving it. But using any statistical query algorithm, you will need two to the n queries. This was Kern's result back then. Okay, so parity being discrete is hard. But since then, it's been extended to a bunch of things, such as um, detecting planted cliques is hard for statistical algorithms, planted satisfiability, and so on. So, and the tools have also been extended. So what we can show here for neural networks is that there exist functions, exactly the family of functions that I described to you, this one layer uh, 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 sum. Uh, so if you use S sharp sigmoids there, then any statistical algorithm learning over any log concave product distribution needs two to the n over S squared queries if you use batches of this size, S squared n. So with batches that are linear in input size, you will need exponentially many queries. That's the, uh, uh, that's the formal version of theorem. So if you use a much bigger batch size, then there is no low bound. It is possible that if you use a very big batch size, it works. In practice, it doesn't work, but it's okay. This doesn't rule it out. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the statement of the theorem. And just to say a word about how, why something like this should be true, if you remember what we have in our uh, description of the of the set of functions, is there are these two to the n roughly two to the n possible functions, and we need to identify one, which one we're talking about. And it's very important that we identify precisely which one we're talking about, because if you take two of these subsets S and T, say at random, then the functions that correspond to them are very different. In fact, their correlation is very small. That's the problem. So if you, if you have, if you have uh, two subsets, the corresponding functions are highly uncorrelated. And we have two to the n of them, and two random ones are uncorrelated. Not every pair. Of course, if you have a subset, another subset, which only changes one of them or a few of the, few of the, the variables, then it is actually quite correlated. And that's part of the challenge of showing the lower bound. And, and in, in, case, in case you've you, you followed the parity part, let me just comment that for the parity function, any two subsets are uncorrelated, completely uncorrelated. Okay, so we don't have that luxury here. Two subsets can be correlated, but the correlation depends on their overlap. And, and in spite of that, we can prove an exponential lower bound, which uh, says that basically all you need is that for a random pair, the correlation should be small. And, it is, and whatever is the number of functions you can get, so that a random pair, the correlation is small, that's your lower bound on the number of queries. Uh, and just one more slide of intuition about this. You know, here is your space of possible functions. These are the two to the n possible subsets that you, you can identify which subset is the zero one weight. If you have a good query, what it does is it, it maps these functions that query queries the answer, let's say the answer to the queries in zero one, to something spread out, so that if the answer you get back is somewhere here, then you know that the possible answers are in a small interval, because the, the answer has a small error. Small interval, and you eliminate the rest. So if your query is able to spread things out, you get to eliminate a lot. But what happens when you have a high statistical dimension is that any query, because you get to pick the query, you can choose the query using exponential time and so on. You get to pick the query. Any query basically takes almost all of the hypothesis space and puts it close to each other. So you, and, and, and a few things far away. So you, you need huge number of queries to, 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 to be confident that you identified the right network. Okay, so roughly speaking, statistical dimension bounds imply query complexity bounds, and using the neural network uh, uh, exercise was, was, was also useful for the method because we had to generalize from uh, um, you know, classification problems where this was introduced, you know, is the parity zero or one, to regression, which is what we need here. We want regression error, and that changes both the, the, the proof as well as the definitions of what it means to be have high statistical dimension. Not the case here, but then you do have a... Good, we do have, that's true. Even with this notion of, uh, even with this notion of, generalized notion of uh, statistical dimension, it is true that there are polynomial upper bounds on a number of queries, not, not competition time, because the computing the query might take a long time, on, uh, on, on solving problem. Yes, so it goes both ways, up to polynomial. 
Um, okay, so this was a lower bound. It's not enough, even with very generic assumptions on the input distribution and the function that it's smooth and all this, because you can't object that the function is not smooth anymore, it's still hard. So what are candidate sufficient conditions? What should we assume to, to have a chance? You know, what is it that's, not only what should we assume, what could possibly be true of all these real life distributions and functions? Right, it's, a, it's sort of a question beyond the theoretical exercise, right? Uh, what assumptions make sense? Any any suggestions? <laughs> Some of you. <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> I can't tell that to my machine learning friends or to my to my mother who's asking why <laughs> this is working, right? So, well, 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 but even, even me, I don't understand. Why 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 do you think images have low statistical dimension? I'm not. I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, uh, if, if you have any suggestions for what you think makes real life easy for for training neural networks, I think it's an. I think it's wide open to come up with a really insightful definition or conceptual characterization. Yeah. Okay. But here is an attempt and one that we can prove. Um, so there are, of course, uh, uh, existing algorithms for special cases of what. Well, uh, learning functions that are either generated by neural networks or for training neural networks. So if you don't use gradient descent, if you use other things, like I mentioned tensor decomposition, um, then you can learn one layer networks, and you still need some conditions. So for example, one of the conditions you need is that the weights of the, going to the hidden layer, if you think of them as the rows of a matrix, then that must have a small condition number. In particular, it cannot be low rank. Okay. Now our matrix was actually low rank. It was all of the one pattern of ones and zeros for the subset. That's it for the whole thing. But our low bound works even if you perturb every weight by a small inverse polynomial. So you can make the condition number polynomial and still low bound works. But here, it, this upper bound also works. Then it's not uh, uh, not a uh, neural network training algorithm. So that's, that's one part. The other part is that using gradient descent, okay, that's the most interesting question. This is the thing that's being used in practice. What can you prove about that? If you just use plain gradient descent, there's not much, but if you use careful regularization, use this addition regularization, then indeed you can recover. Basically, what they do in that paper is that they add these regularization terms that correspond to uh, um, yeah, steps of the tensor algorithm itself, and, and you can do it in this case plus some additional assumptions. If you make very strong assumptions on the generating network, so you assume that these uh, units that are taking weights from the input are essentially non-overlapping. They are going to disjoint subsets of the input. Then you can learn it. Um, then there is uh, something called residual nets where at each time you also get input straight from the input level. Uh, also under some, in the, in the assumptions there you can. And perhaps the closest thing to what I'm going to talk about is that if you use this activation function e to the z instead of sigmoids or values, and you assume that the target function is a polynomial of, of some binary degree, then gradient descent works. Okay, so the target function, so x is being labeled as some polynomial of x, low degree, say a quadratic, then, uh, 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 and you, you get to use e to the z as your activation function, then it works. Um, I've seen a proposal last year, I don't completely understand it, about a kernel framework that seems to apply for many layers and so on. Uh, but I, I, um, it'll be interesting to see where that goes, to, to give an explanation for when it works. Okay, so here's the, here's the type of assumption, the assumption that we'll make, and that's the motivating thing. So first we'll assume that the input distribution is uniform on the sphere, so these are unit vectors, so as you could know, they're normalized. For or Gaussian, it's fine. So anything that's readily, readily symmetric, spherically symmetric. Um, the units are unbiased. A crucial aspect of the lower bound was that we use different biases for each unit. You know, you shift the input combination by minus one, minus two, minus three, plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on. Here, they are unbiased or constant biases. In so fact, you're allowed to use only the same bias everywhere. So already the input class doesn't fit here. I mean, the, the lower bound class doesn't fit here. 
Um, and then uh, that's, that's basically it. And then we're, we're just saying that the sum of the, these, these things previously was just an average, well, they, they cannot have, their, their weights cannot add up to too much. There's some bound on what the sum of those weights is. Okay? So you can't just do some scaling trick. So if, you take, if your input is of this form, it implies that this function is approximately low degree. It must approximately be a low degree polynomial. Okay? That takes a proof, but uh, that's one of the nice things you get out of this. If you assume unbiased and that it's uh, uh, the sum of the weights of the outer layer is small, you get an approximately low degree function. And so this will be the type of uh, 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 problem we're after for which we'll prove a theorem. Let me represent for a function f, f superscript less than or equal to k as the function projected to a degree at most k polynomial, meaning its best degree k approximation. So there's a function that's not necessarily polynomial, it's some function, but of course you can approximate any function with polynomials, potentially a very high degree. If I limit the degree of the polynomial at k, there is some error I get, so what is that best approximation? That's the that's the f less than equal to k is the best polynomial approximation. Since we're dealing with a sphere, I'm talking about projections to the sphere, polynomials on the sphere. So our goal is that, so we think of opt as the error of the best one, the existential best one, best degree k approximation. And we want to find g using neural network training so that its error is at most this best plus epsilon which you get to control the epsilon. You can make the epsilon as small as you want. So we'll compare ourselves with the best possible error of a degree k approximation. That's the type of thing, right? Now, is degree k natural or not? You can argue about that, but this is what we can prove something. And so the theorem with John Williams, uh, who is also a co-author in the lower bound paper, is that if you use k as your degree, then this works uniformly with all degrees, then if you use m to the k over poly epsilon units, that's the number of units in the hidden layer, and you initialize your function randomly, completely randomly. Each of the weights is a random unit vector. Uh, and the output layer is linear. Um, and you run standard gradient descent. Right? Each time you're taking a batch of some examples, standard stock, batch gradient descent, that version of stochastic gradient descent, and you're computing the gradient and, and updating. Then after this number of units, and to the game, but without the poly epsilon, just log one over epsilon rounds you will reach this goal error of the best possible degree k approximation plus epsilon. That's the gap. Okay. Um, so as a corollary, we get that if, if the data was in fact generated by a one hidden layer uh, 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 network where the, the weights in the, uh, uh, at, the, at the hidden layer have small length and the weights at the upper layer have small sum of values, then you, you get a bound on the number of units you need to learn any such network using just straightforward gradient descent on the least squares loss. No, no additional complications. So in the remaining uh, few minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so, I'll try to describe what goes into this, this uh, the main ideas that go into this, because I believe that it, it's very far from what we could hope to prove or, or generalize. Um, so if you take a single unit there with some weight A, U is a set of weights, sigma is, the, is, is, is some activation unit, A dot sigma, then you know, the loss is the, this, the expectation of F minus G squared, and the gradient with respect to that weight A, I'm just computing the gradient of this function, right? So it's a square, so I get F minus G, I've ignored a factor of two here, okay, there's a two there, times the gradient with respect to A, right? So it's basically a linear function with respect to A, so you just have the unit out here, sigma. Okay? So that's the gradient. If you look at this, it's the expectation of F minus G, which is the residual, you know, the difference between your function and the target, times the activation at that U. Okay, so this is the gradient with respect to any weight A for the unit U. This expectation looks very much like a quantity that's quite uh, well studied in, uh, in uh, analysis, in spherical analysis in particular. It's called the Funk transform. And it uh, basically 
says that for every function h with respect to a function sigma, h in this case is the residual f minus g, this is this transformation is exactly this expectation. It's the expectation of the function weighted by this activation unit. Okay? U is fixed, right? So for each u, it's computing a value. If you think about this uh, um, um, uh, uh, geometrically, all it's saying is that there exists, uh, uh, there's some function out there in space, and you are picking a vector u, then there's a sigma of u dot x for all functions, gives you some weighting. You know, maybe it's how, uh, you know, in, in fact, we know what sigma, if it's a sigma, the weighting will look like you know, something like that. But then this function f minus u, or the function h in space, that's some function. We don't know where, where it's high, where it's low, and so on. And we're computing the average of that function with respect to this weighting. That's the transform. Okay, so that's the transform. Now, what is nice about this transform is, okay, this is just an example showing you what the, if you have this original function on the circle, what the transform looks like. Um, but going back, this is a, this, 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 this formula captures why this transform has a chance of being analyzed. So this is the transform applied to some function p. But if this function p was a polynomial, okay, and in particular what's called a spherical harmonic, that just means uh, uh, these are these are polynomials that whose uh, um, Laplace is zero, which 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 just means that if you add up the second derivatives with respect to each coordinate, you get zero. Okay, so so this is particularly nice for the sphere. And so if you take any any such polynomial, then the answer to this transform is just the polynomial itself scaled by a constant. But the constant depends only on the function, the, the, fun, the form of the function, and k, the degree. But the, the, the transform is not changing the function except by a constant, if it's a polynomial. The transform applied to a polynomial gives you back the same polynomial scaled. So therefore, if you take a sum of these polynomials also, you get the same thing. So, uh, and, and this constant looks like n to the minus k. So, uh, as a result of this, here's what we can say. You're taking your weights a u and updating them by this transform, right? Because that's the gradient. And then if you look at how you change the function itself, well, it's, the function itself is computed as an average over all those weights, and the weights are changing by this much, the transform. So it's like the transform applied twice. Right, it's composed. And so the change in the function is the transform applied twice. Now I write here approximately for two reasons. Each of those transforms we don't compute exactly, of course, we're computing over a sample of examples and a sample of unit vectors. Okay, so that's why it's approximate. And uh, as a result, so the update looks like this transform applied twice. As a result, uh, if your residual is mostly, you know, has small degree, then the change in the function is just depends on the on the current error. So whenever you have you know large current error, this is the current loss, then the you know you're going to change your, your function by a good amount and therefore reduce the loss. Okay, that's where you get the n to the minus k. That's the source of the n to the minus k. So see, so in the exact world, you would say if your function had zero errors, so f minus zero is zero then this transformation also has zero error. But there's a scaling going on. We need to show this approximately so that we, we, we can make progress all the way. And that's the, that's the technical difficulty in, in, in establishing that this actually works. So that's, that's as much as I was going to say about the, 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 the proof and proof technique here. Uh, um, um, uh, n to the k as a bound is not very satisfactory even if k is constant. It, it doesn't reflect. Now we did run experiments on these things with random initialized networks and so on, and it works uh, with you know reasonable number of units in practice. It does, certainly doesn't look like n to the k. So there is, even for this specific case where we assume the data is coming from a one layer network with weights summing to one and no bias, the upper bound is not does not reflect what's happening in practice. On the other hand, the upper bound you could, you could say is much more general than what that case, because what we are saying is that you will get the best possible error of the degree k approximation for any function, not just one that's generated by a, by a 
by a, a one layer sigmoid zone. So, uh, so in this generality, probably this is tight. Don't know for sure, but maybe that's not important. What's maybe the key is how do we really analyze what's happening in in this case? Okay, so um, I'm happy to take questions, but I have some questions of my own that I'd like to understand. So yeah, so the first one is what we've talked about. Is gradient descent faster than what we proved here? Is it just, just polynomial or so on? Does have, having many layers actually help? It's only one layer, right? But I'm talking about help with computational efficiency. So there are already good uh, 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 papers showing that for the purpose of representation, yes, one layer is enough, but you could save exponentially in the size if you allow many layers. There exist functions for which using multiple layers gives you an exponential improvement in the representation size. Okay, but now if you assume the representation size is already small, does having many layers help with training, with efficiency, computation efficiency? Or is it just another hurdle we have to overcome? Um, but maybe this number three, and I left a gap here for that reason, one of the things you might have heard about in practice is that these networks have millions, many millions of parameters, and the data is often smaller than the size of the network. And yet it works. What does it works mean? That you separate some of your data and you leave it for testing purposes. You train on this data, which is smaller than the number of parameters you're using. And then you test on the testing data and it still has low error. So it's generalizing. So how is it possible that using lesser data than the number of parameters, you're able to achieve generalization? This cause of kind of goes against all of learning theory at least, where you need at least as much data as the as the dimension of your, of the concept class that you're learning. So there's, you know, another uh, theoretical thing to be said here. In the context of just these one layer networks, here is a thought, you know, what we're doing here is, uh, you know, randomly initializing the network. So you can think of um, this, uh, uh, this initial set of weights as being some unit vectors on a sphere, a random initialize, and then we apply gradient descent. This gradient descent will change things, but not too much. You know, each of these weights moves a little, moves a little. So we log one over epsilon rounds, and then we get very low, very good loss. Now, if instead of this particular initialization, it was a random initialization, you try a different initialization. Just do it again. Same data, do it again. So your vectors will be very different. They're random, very different. They all move again a little bit, and you've reached your new point, which is again very low loss. So there's, there's this huge, this multitude of possible correct answers. And it's very easy to find them. Just start at a random place, apply gradient descent, and boom, we've got a low, low error. It's happening all over the place. What's the right notion of dimension that tells you that this means that you need little data? Right? So it seems to me that the fact that gradient descent is working is telling us that you know, it's, it's, uh, there's an implicitly low dimensional phenomenon going on. And that's as much data as you'll need, not the number of parameters. And I, I don't know how to characterize that either. This is mostly a talk about what I don't know, but yeah. what else can neural networks learn probably efficiently? Okay, one way I find that maybe there are other classes of things. For example, people have analyzed linear dynamical systems, or you can apply this to so many things. So. And finally, getting back to this, what is the real world structure that makes it easy to learn? Okay, these are attempts. You now we've talked about things like product distributions and Gaussians. Maybe even that is not the right thing to look at. Those are nice from a theoretical mathematical point of view, but maybe in reality, having correlations helps you. you know, maybe correlations among the variables is a way to make the learning easier. And so, so, so those models of input distributions also might not be the right ones for the purpose of the real world. Um, and finally, you know, uh, is it possible that if you have some random type of weights, you know, the, the, the loss function, this, this expected squared loss, in general, it's highly non-convex. But maybe as you use more and more units, it gets closer to a convex function. And therefore, approximate local minima, most of the time, with high probability, are as good as, are, 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 are comparable to true local optima. Um, that, that's all I have in, in this uh, presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. I think you mentioned that there are 
So that particular paper was for uh, e to the z, e to the z, z with uh, polynomial. You assume the target is polynomial. But what we, what I just, uh, the theorem I described here works for uh, uh, any activation unit, including e to the minus z. All we require is that if you look at its spectrum and its coefficients in the polynomial representation, they should not vanish where the target has non-zero code. So if the target is uh, written as some polynomial, possibly with very high degree, Wherever you need to go to get a good approximation, all those non-zero coefficients should also be represented in your activation unit. Now, the nice thing about sigmoids is that for every even uh, odd one, you get non-zero. For values, for every even one, you get non-zero. So they are universal. E to the z, of course, you get for every one. So but you give me any activation function that has non-zero spectrum, and that will work. Yes? Taking off from your comment on correlation of variables, would you have it proof work if you had a correlated Yeah, no, at the moment, no. Uh, it, uh, you know, this type of uh, uh, transformation, circular or, or, or Fourier transform for that matter, any kind of Fourier thing, heavily relies on independence of, of coordinates. So, uh, uh, even if you knew the type of correlation, like a linearly transformed Gaussian, uh, it would be nice to have the right analysis, yeah. In this upper bound theorem, we assume that it's spherically symmetric. So it includes uniform on the sphere and Gaussian. I suspect that it works for any product distribution of the same, you know, uh, take the same distribution and apply it, uh, uh, product lock on distribution. But that's not proven. <coughs> Yes. There is also a approach in which people have trained like a recurrent neural network to estimate the parameters for Markov chain which converges to some stationary distribution which is your target distribution of interest. Uh -huh. So are you also having a like how such a framework might, I think even this one is paper by Surya Aoi or Deep, so why is that moving? Uh, I see. So they are uh, um, observing a Markov chain. Uh, what is the initial distribution? It can something like a Gaussian something, but you're trying to make it converge to some complicated distribution. Uh, and what is the data you're getting? You just have samples. From the Markov chain. Images. Oh, images. oh images. you assume that those images are from a Markov. Got it. Trying to learn the power trajectory as well. Got it, I see. So, so if you're assuming like the, it's a product distribution or something independent, yeah, really it's right. actually, uh, yeah, the sequence of examples you're getting are not independent. So this was about the examples, they're not coming independently, rather, they're coming from a Markov chain. Or a pattern of yeah, I, they, they, I, I don't know. This certainly doesn't apply as is. People have considered this for in, in pack learning. Instead of using our idea assumptions, what can you do with the Markov chain? There's some things you can do, but certainly not as as generally. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. And, uh,